Uh, just want to welcome you guys to our Thrive Summit. So excited that you guys have joined us. If I have not met you, my name is Mackenzie, and I am on staff at Bayside Church, and also have the massive privilege of being able to just host this uh, breakout which is gonna be amazing. A couple of housekeeping things for you guys to all know before we jump in is for you to know that you guys are all actually on mute currently. Uh, the reason being is we have a lot of people who are joining us on here. So we're gonna give Mel the floor in a little bit here and he's gonna do a presentation. At the end, we have questions and answers. So the way we're gonna go about this is if you have a question while he's talking at any point, go ahead and private message me in the chat and I will be collecting all of those questions and then feeding them to him at the very end. So feel free at any time to send me, again, it's Mackenzie Cook, uh, a private message on that chat at any time. And I will be making sure those settings are open here in, in the next few minutes as well. So can you just give me a thumbs up if all that, all that sounds good if you're there? Wonderful. Okay, fantastic. So we are gonna go ahead and get started. It is my absolute privilege to introduce you to Mel McGowan, who has uh, joined us actually in previous Thrive conferences. And even when I was looking at the definition of what this breakout was gonna be, I am extremely excited, I've been waiting all day for this. So uh, Mel is a Disney alumni, as well as the Chief Creative Officer of Storyland Studios. And so we're gonna be looking into what Imagineering looks like, but also how that relates to our faith, as well as evangelism. So with that being said, Mel, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you go ahead and go for it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mackenzie. Great to be with you guys. Um, can't wait to, to share some of the brain damage that uh, I incurred uh, during the decade at Disney. Uh, but more importantly, in the two decades since, um, we've had amazing opportunities around the world to apply that to uh, companies and causes, including about a thousand ministries around the world, including trying to catch up to Pastor Ray uh, and the team at Bayside and Lincoln Brewster and all the great creatives you guys have uh, on the team at Bayside. But great to be with you guys this afternoon. Uh, what I'm going to really do is kind of, in a way, just kind of fast forward you through uh, at some level my story. Uh, that's all I've got. Uh, but there's also, I think, hopefully you'll find some interesting parallels with uh, the story of someone I personally consider one of the greatest storytellers of the 20th century. Um, and I find out that as I'm talking to uh, millennials and younger, I always have to remind myself to let them know that there was this guy named Walt Disney, that Walt Disney was a dude before it was this global corporate uh, brand based on storytelling. Uh, and again, what I hope to do is merge a little bit of my own story testimonial with uh, that of Walt Disney. So let me uh, um, share my screen real quick. Uh, bear with me. Uh, Mackenzie, I'm not sure. I think you might need to let me share my screen. Okay, let me check. Let's see. So while I'm working out some of that stuff, uh, generally you speaking, what we, uh, you guys able to see that okay? Thumbs up. Great stories, great, awesome. So basically, um, you know, the, the idea that, uh, you know, I think we gleaned from um, this guy named Walt Disney was, um, you know, a, a guy that grew up, born uh, around the turn of the last century, 1901, uh, never really finished school. Um, he really wasn't gifted by God with the traditional um, gifting uh, that a lot of verbal oral storytellers that, uh, that, uh, that I'm, I'm jealous of. Uh, have uh, many of you on the call probably uh, can probably steward uh, the gospel and God's story in a way that I, I just wish I could if I, I if I could get through sentences without saying dude at least twice. Um, but again, Walt Disney wasn't one of those guys that could fill a room based on his oral uh, storytelling skills. So he learned at an early age that he really needed to lean into uh, artists and architects and artisans that were uh, better at him at certain aspects of storytelling to get those stories out to a wide audience uh, around the world. And that's really kind of how we're modeled uh, at Storyland Studios. We do have this group called Plain Joe uh, Church Design, which is our kind of uh, secret ops uh, studio that's focused on nonprofits and ministry work. And that of course is uh, subsidized by uh, the actual paid work that we do, the for-profit work. Uh, and the way that we approach uh, what we do is a little different from uh, I think most uh, groups that I'm aware of. Uh, I don't actually know of any other group other than Disney that does uh, what we do uh, in-house. And we call it three-dimensional storytelling. 
Uh, we've got a team of about 100 people that are actually structured along these three core um, kind of tripod legs of, uh, of storytelling. Uh, we call that strategic storytelling, digital, and spatial storytelling. Uh, and we think it's super important to, to tie uh, that story from the ether to the environment together. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into that and what that means. But again, um, you know, the, the, the notion of being able to get stories across uh, when people aren't physically gathered inside of a bricks and mortar space is really key. And obviously in today's day and age, particular, particularly in this COVID era, the ability to do that virtually and digitally is, is obviously kind of a big deal. Uh, but it starts with this, this notion of strategic storytelling. But I wanna go back to uh, kind of uh, the clients and the story partners that we get to, to serve. Um, probably there's a 50-50 split between companies and causes and again, uh, the Plain Joe Studio is kind of our group focused on ministry, uh, but then we really get to work with uh, some of the, the top brands in terms of storytelling around the world. I'll share just a handful of those with you, um, but really it starts with uh, the 10 years that I spent with a, a little Mickey Mouse operation called the Walt Disney Company, and I started there in 1990. Um, I won't tell you how, how old or young I was, but uh, got to spend uh, about a decade there, and while I was there, I learned a few key lessons that really have kind of uh, followed me and uh, the journey uh, with uh, ministries around the world. And I just wanted to share kind of at a high level uh, a, a few lessons that uh, I kind of feel like I got passed down uh, from Walt, uh, even though uh, he died just uh, about a year or two before I was born. Uh, guys that definitely learned at his feet. The first lesson I want to talk about is this, this idea of blowing up the box. Um, whatever paradigm, whatever box you're working with, uh, the ability to kind of blow past those constraints and boundaries. And uh, again, this is uh, Walt Disney. If you've never seen a picture of him, there's a, a shot of him uh, sketching uh, Mickey Mouse. Funny little uh, secret is he actually wasn't that even great of, a, of an artist. He did a little bit of a graffiti work in World War I, but he really from the earliest days of Mickey Mouse realized he needed guys that could draw better and faster than himself, including uh, Mickey Mouse. Um, so this is kind of a posed uh, picture here. But one of the things about Walt that I appreciated, he never let whatever uh, dimensions of a piece of paper or a canvas limit the reach of his storytelling. He pretty rapidly moved beyond uh, kind of graffiti work to uh, kind of comic strips and Sunday funnies to uh, moving into motion pictures. Uh, but then quickly, even in the motion picture realm, he early on was blending live action, live actors with animation. He early on was getting bored with whatever formats he was given. Um, and so, you know, early before Roger Rabbit, before a lot of the CG work, uh, he was mixing uh, actors and animation. Uh, but then quickly, he was bored with even the format of the theaters that they were presenting his films in. So he was going in and doing custom retrofits of theaters for movies like um, Fantasia with uh, the earliest versions of surround sound and, and IMAX large screen formats. Um, again, one of the first innovators in terms of sound in film. And so again, whatever boundaries, whatever format he was given, he was always trying to take storytelling to the next level. At the prime of his life, he really was kind of bored with two dimensional storytelling. And that's how he kind of stumbled uh, to what we call the art of imagineering. Uh, the idea that what if you could not only let a, a guest step into the screen, uh, you know, and another way I think of that is kind of sneaking into a Hollywood backlot and walking in through some of the backlots and false facades. What if you walked and opened up the door of a false facade and, and didn't just see a bunch of weeds uh, behind that false front? What if you could go deeper and deeper into that rabbit hole? And that basically was the concept of Disneyland, uh, the theme park. I really think of it as the first three dimensional cinematic uh, televisual environment. Uh, and really the entire park is basically uh, just a storytelling device where you're, you're stepping foot into the different televisual filmic genres of mid-century America. And that basic same footprint ironically has been so uh, powerful that wherever it's been applied around the world, it literally has become the top human mousetrap on the planet. Uh, so Disneyland Paris, despite whatever negative press it outdrew uh, visitors uh, to the Eiffel Tower and to the Louvre Museum from day one. Um, the, the parks that are open in China, the first one, Hong Kong, used the exact blueprints and elevations from Disneyland were, that were first developed in 1953, adapted that to 21st century China, and is still, uh, I mean, the, the, the Shanghai Disneyland was a top attended 
theme park uh, in its first year in the world with over 11 million people. So there's something innate about this, uh, this mousetrap that, uh, you know, draws on these kind of shared narratives uh, that humans uh, have. Uh, when I started uh, with the Walt Disney Company, um, again, we thought we had a box in a constraint. I was handed a, a Delta uh, hand of cards that was kind of a challenge. Um, the original Disneyland Park uh, had aged quite a bit. It was approaching its uh, mid-century 50th anniversary. Um, and uh, the, the reality is the area around it was kind of going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, it was surrounded by about two square miles of, of suburban sprawl slash urban blight. Uh, you had a uh, hundred acre parking lot, just a black asphalt heat sink in front of it. Um, but then surrounding it, including right across the street from the Disneyland Hotel, you had motels that you could um, rent by the hour for the hookers or by the month for families that were about to be homeless. Uh, and then also you had um, some of the worst gang neighborhoods in, in Southern California. We had the Jeffrey Lynn neighborhood right across the street from the Disneyland Hotel. And so in uh, the area that they're getting ready to build a new Disney vacation club, we actually had stray bullets from the gang neighborhood um, reaching uh, through the, the curtain wall of the hotel. So welcome to the happiest place on earth. Uh, and so we had a little bit of a challenge to kind of redeem this little bit of, um, of something that felt like paradise when Walt Disney first bought the land. It was just thousands of acres of, of orange groves and a lush green carpet overlooking the Santa Ana Mountains. But again, when I got there, it wasn't exactly looking uh, so hot. If any of you have ever seen the movie Escape from L.A., that wasn't uh, too far off uh, from what Disneyland looked like when I got there, at least the surrounding environment. And the reality is, as a corporate... Uh, uh, organization, there's no way that they could justify spending hundreds of millions of dollars in capital improvement when the city uh, was kind of not uh, really taking care of business outside of their uh, perimeter. Uh, and so instead, they chose to invest in properties uh, around the world. But we basically made a deal with the city and said, hey, if we uh, were to help you figure out a vision uh, for kind of uh, tearing up the parking lot and putting up paradise and redeeming and renewing, uh, this part of the city around us, um, you know, we would be willing to to double whatever public investment you do uh, with private investment. And so it's a long story, but we ended up uh, spending about a billion and a half dollars, which sounds like a lot of money, but not when you're cleaning up two square miles and 1,100 acres. Uh, and really the, the story that we chose to tell on that former parking lot uh, was a, a story that we felt we could only tell in this specific soil specific context. Uh, and that ended up being the, the specific story of the people and the place of this golden state of mind uh, that was uh, California. And to me, in a lot of ways, that represented this place that dreamers and doers around the world would come uh, to America, and then they would keep on trucking uh, until they ran out of land uh, and then hit the fertile soil uh, of the golden state where uh, a lot of us get to do life and ministry. And for all its ups and downs, uh, the reality is historically, that fertile soil has worked out pretty well for innovators and dreamers like Walt Disney and Steve Jobs and Howard Hughes and a lot of Hollywood moguls, a lot of Silicon Valley uh, pioneers. So um, again, that was the story. And then we thought we'd take you on this kind of ge geographical road trip journey from the mountains to the seas, the deserts to the farms. Uh, and the other thing about that theme, by the way, is that it ended up being extremely flexible. I'm a big believer in the the missing uh, beatitude that blessed are the flexible for we will not break. So whatever theme we wanted to apply, uh, we wanted something that could be flexible so that, hey, uh, when Disney ends up buying Marvel, they could build a Marvel Studios or a, a Avengers Campus as they're doing uh, currently. Or if they buy Pixar, they could, uh, they could create Pixar Pier or uh, Bugs Land. And so it ended up working out fairly well. So in our ministry work, um, this is a, a project we did for a, a buddy of mine who was a church planner in the Detroit metro area. His name's Dave Dummett. He just got handed the keys for a little uh, janky church called Willow Creek Community Church up in Chicago. But this was uh, all he could afford back when we were first working together, which was basically uh, an abandoned uh, community center. Um, again, outside of Detroit, it was an old racquetball uh, private sports complex. It had been abandoned for about 20 years. Uh, when I first walked through this facility, I remember being kind of nervous because I, you know, I generally have plenty of uh, confidence in uh, my design intervention capabilities, but I, I thought this looked like a scene from The Walking Dead. There was stuff growing on the, on the floor, growing on the roof. Uh, it was kind of intimidating, but, so, but because it was in Detroit, we had to 
be really flexible with this architecture of impermanence. Nothing could look expensive. So we end up using uh, an early uh, implementation of shipping containers for this kind of architecture of uh, kind of a church on the move. Uh, this is another uh, context entirely. This is um, uh, outside of Houston in an area called the Woodlands, uh, Texas. Uh, and in this case, we were able to preserve a number of oak trees on campus, create a, a fishing hole, uh, leave a, a deer stand that the senior pastor loved doing bow hunting from out in the backyard and create basically kind of a, almost a state park uh, kind of vibe. Uh, and uh, it almost has a Texas roadhouse kind of lodge kind of feel. We actually collected license plates uh, for about a year and use those for shingles on the building. So again, the idea is that this has to kind of, uh, kind of work with the, the culture. Before we get to design anything, we almost have to be cultural anthropologists and incorporate kind of the unique story and context that we're in. Uh, and this, by the way, was their phase one building that was designed to flex and adapt uh, ultimately to be a youth center um, rather than an ultimate uh, worship center. Second lesson that I learned uh, from uh, Walt Disney and uh, the organization was simply the idea of doing your homework. Um, a lot of people mistakenly think that creativity is just getting people in a room and getting them juiced up and ca caffeined up or, you know, whatever, and just squirting out and spurting as many ideas as possible and throwing them down on the whiteboard and what have you. But there is actually a, kind of a, almost a pre-creative uh, process that uh, we think is invaluable. Um, I call it homework. Uh, we also call it due diligence or discovery. Uh, and again, just the example with Walt Disney was uh, this, this idea that the reason that uh, the original Disney park is where it is, is the first thing he did was he went to Stanford and hired some of the smartest young kids he could find that were uh, that were really at the time just inventing the whole discipline of dem dem demographics uh, and um, looking at uh, everything from transportation infrastructure, uh, where the Interstate Five was uh, was planning its right away through Southern California, and what they were doing was where they were they were basically. Um, forecasting where the center of gravity, the center of population was going to be uh, in Southern California. And for that reason, they decided that the best place to do uh, this, this dream that he had been uh, nurturing for 20 years of a place that a dad could make some memories for his daughters wasn't in fact this vacant lot that he had set his heart on across the street from his uh, studio in, uh, in LA Burbank, Hollywood area. Um, but in fact that uh, really he needed to go uh, about 30 miles uh, southeast of that uh, to head towards uh, Orange County across the, the Orange Curtain. Uh, and that ended up being a, a pretty solid decision because they, they landed it. But again, when I got, by the time I got there, um, Walt Disney himself had already given up on the area. He was really disgusted at the quality uh, you know, of the, the development, uh, the, the kind of urban blight. Uh, he called it kind of a third rate Las Vegas strip, kind of this red light district that had emerged around it. In fact, he kind of gave up, he threw in the towel. He basically decided to buy 45 square miles, uh, the same size as the city of San Francisco. He bought 45 square miles in Florida uh, to uh, kind of start uh, afresh on virgin territory. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But again, by the time I got there, we realized that it wasn't an option anymore to just close our eyes and ignore what was going on outside of our uh, protected uh, hillside berm that really safely encapsulated what was going on inside the park. We really had to kind of look at uh, what was going on in the in the city and the region. And we ended up identifying this area around Anaheim Stadium, uh, the former Disneyland parking lot, and the convention center. And we cast this vision of what if we could create uh, a scenario where basically we brought the garden back into the city, kind of brought that marriage between uh, the city of heaven and the, the Garden of Eden together. Uh, a little biblical at some level, it's certainly ambitious, but what if we could remarry the garden in the city and, uh, and create this urban resort garden district? Uh, almost got laughed out of the room when we presented that, but um, we actually had to do the math and figure out how to make that happen. And I won't get into it, but basically we, we um, figured out how to uh, mess with uh, some, some metrics and financial levers like things like the, the transit occupancy tax, the hotel bed tax, uh, that if we were able to increase length of stay by a half day, raise the hotel bed, bed tax from 11% to 13%, that that little magic metric 
would basically fully fund uh, cleaning up all the public realm, city streets uh, around us. And then uh, as a private corporation, then we were able to focus our investment on, on the property that we controlled. Uh, so again, part of that effort was creating the world's largest uh, parking garage, uh, a parking garage for over 10,000 cars um, with direct freeway on ramps, off ramps, uh, again, cleaning up about 1,100 acres, uh, almost using every palm tree we could find uh, in California to uh, create a lush oasis uh, garden district. And when we work with ministries, uh, again, some of that left brain, right brain stuff has to happen before we get to, to put pencil to paper. Uh, we actually have a strategic financial and, and ministry model uh, that's part of that strategic storytelling where we go through, these, these are color coded based on the questions that we ask um, of uh, strategic ministry planning. We work with a group called Intentional Churches, for example, and we, we figure out how do we get everyone on the team uh, measuring the same metrics and the same dashboards uh, to fulfill our missional goals that we're able to look at the stuff in blue, uh, all the boring facility architectural building plan questions. And then we match all that with the disciplines in green, all the, uh, the cash flow. How much can you beg, borrow, and steal? How much can you fundraise? How much can you borrow? Uh, how can you um, streamline ministry operations? And all those metrics, all those hundreds of variables have to come together uh, to be able to create a baseline uh, of a project. Uh, and again, it's the same feasibility model that we, we go through today when we're working on entirely new theme parks or new destination resorts or a new hotel. Uh, and again, the key thing for ministries is managing the supply demand chart of, of looking at the, the demand as ministries are growing and then making sure that you don't just run out of cash or run out of seats. And there's quite a bit of science and magic uh, in doing that. So we've uh, tended to work with uh, some of the top financial and strategic ministry experts um, in the world in figuring out how to do that. Uh, lesson three, uh, be true to your story, just be authentic. Uh, we've learned that uh, in the last few decades, there's been this huge healthy movement uh, in terms of particularly church growth, in terms of figuring out what do we have in common uh, as, as churches? How do we get past some of the denominational divides? How do we stop majoring on the minors? And what do we have in common as uh, kind of Bible-based, New Testament, Great Commission churches? And there's been some great movement in terms of churches rallying around things like church planting and the, the purpose-driven church and those kind of things. But on the flip side of that is we've learned that uh, one of the things that gets missed in that conversation sometimes is the idea that God is a creative God and he has written uh, a unique story for every ecclesia, just like he does for every person. Uh, and, you know, I, I love to see God's creativity reflected in all the different flora and fauna and all the different animals and and plants. And we've seen the same thing with every minister being totally unique, totally different. And the way that Walt Disney uh, was true to his own story was reaching back to his earliest memories and childhood roots. Uh, I actually had a chance to visit his hometown of Marceline, Missouri, this little railroad town, and actually spent the night on the second floor of that building on the left, the Main Street Cinema. Uh, and his earliest memories also were uh, you know, looking through the gates of a local Missouri, uh, actually outside of Kansas City, a, a local Missouri fun park. It was actually a trolley park uh, called Electric City. And so there's no record that he ever actually got in there, but him and his sister would just look through these pearly gates and see this vision of, of what would have seemed to him like heaven on earth, you know, seeing electric lights uh, for the first time in his life. And for me, I had kind of a similar story because I, I actually was born in Vietnam. I got out right before the fall of Saigon. My mom was Vietnamese, my dad was an American GI. But then my other earliest memories was looking down the lights at Main Street USA at night. And, and that kind of image kind of just burned itself uh, into my memory because I actually grew up in Europe and in, in Germany and never really got to get back uh, to Disneyland. So I just had this weird skewed vision of, or, or a memory of what America was about. This, this, and to me, it was this, this vision of this world as it could and should be. Uh, rather than uh, as it necessarily was. And, and that's really been something that's caused me to pursue this, this notion of figuring out not just how to create, solve and, and to craft and draw a technical master plan, but how do I prayerfully discern and discover and seek God's good, acceptable, and perfect will and, and, and figure out with our ministry partners what, what uh, just could be the Lord's, uh, the master's plan. And one of the things we've found on that is it starts with story. 
rather than just starting with the traffic counts and seat counts and parking counts and how many butts do we need to get in seats and how quickly can we get cars in and out and that kind of thing, the first thing we need to do is start with a story. And the, the key uh, ingredient to great stories is this idea of um, what we call story circles. And that's just this, this notion that every great story, again, has uh, great characters, uh, an interesting and well-developed setting, uh, and then a clear plot. That, that question of who, where, and why is so often missing in, in stories. And that really is a, a key litmus test of next time you watch a, a Netflix uh, movie that you stream and you wish you had that two hours back, it's probably because they didn't flesh out one of these three story elements and these uh, foundational elements. So whenever we start a project, this is literally the first few hours of what we do when we start uh, new projects. Uh, we go through this idea of story circles. And to me, it's just this wonderful metaphor of getting around the campfire and uh, getting down to the fundamentals of what storytelling is. The, the idea that story has the power of forming who we are and transforming who we be can become. And uh, of course, the gospel is basically just a great story. And, and you know, the, the first example that we were able to apply that in the ministry con context was a, a town uh, here in Southern California, ironically called Corona. Uh, and before it got hit with the stigma of coronavirus, and before it was known as uh, Spanish for beer, uh, we actually did some digging and we found the dictionary definition of Corona. And we found this cool definition that was this concentric circle of light surrounding a luminous body. And so when we consider this circle of light, circle of community, circle of friends, uh, in this particular case, we were able to go to the city and say, what if we did a church of the next millennium? This was, again, back in the 90s. What if we were able to, to not just do uh, a, an old Spanish mission, Neo Taco chapel or cathedral, because that's all the city wanted. They wanted red tile roofs, Neo Taco Bell architecture. We said, what if we were to create this, this Mediterranean style uh, city on a hill uh, that had this, this, this powerful theme of a circle of light. What if we could recreate this idea of this cathedral piazza square that it exists throughout the Mediterranean world that, that really just doesn't exist in the United States of generica, particularly in suburbia where we've forgotten how to create, the, create these great people places. And what if the church was actually, again, the anchor tenant of this uh, postmodern piazza, just like churches and sacred spaces have always been the, the gathering, the anchor tenant to third places and gathering places around the world. And so we actually were able to create that and create this, uh, this great uh, court that is uh, almost this Trinity fountain. There's a uh, pop jet fountains, there's this Trinity fountain. We've got the tallest point in the city. It was actually a cell tower that we created that's LED lit with a, the, a, a cold capital lit cross on top. The, the actual structures here are actually really cost-effective pre-engineered steel metal butler buildings, but it was really not about the buildings. It was about the spaces between the buildings. Um, and again, that started with this blue sky phase, which is always the, the starting point of any uh, project that we take on. This isn't a, a phase that's part of normal architecture. This is what we did at Disney Imagineering, where we start with uh, blowing up the box, uh, really understanding what the heart and the core of the story is, uh, and then generating uh, at the intersection of character, plot, and setting, generating a big idea. Again, in, in that crossroads case, it was that idea of uh, a circle of light. And I'll give you a few more examples of that as we go on. Uh, lesson four is surrounding yourself with better storytellers. And again, I, this is one of the biggest things that I appreciate about Walt Disney, that he was self-aware, humble, honest, intelligent enough to realize that he had certain limitations that he was never gonna command an audience at the same level. Uh, when I think of great 20th century storytellers, I mean, you had some good ones, Martin Luther King, Billy Graham, John F. Kennedy, uh, you name it. Um, and, uh, you know, when we think of preaching, Jesus was pretty good, you know? And, uh, it's, it's kind of a challenge when you're, you're comparing, I know I used to do that, compare myself to these amazing orators. Well, again, what I appreciated from Walt Disney was, he didn't even try to compete in that circle, but he was able to uh, bring together the, these motley crews and, and people that, uh, you know, had these odd skill sets uh, that he was able, within Disney Imagineering, we actually had 140 different disciplines represented, and we have dozens of disciplines represented 
in our Storyland Studios teams of, again, artists, architects, artisans, uh, accountants, uh, project managers, uh, sculptors. Uh, it, it just takes a lot of different skill sets to get those uh, stories across from the ether to the environment. Uh, and so uh, in this case, I, I love this story. This, was, this is also the story of the first blue sky process uh, on record. And this was uh, basically a, a drawing that we used to call the Magna Carta of Walt Disney Imaginary. Uh, basically, Walt Disney had this 20-year dream that he had been kind of nurturing and incubating of this place that uh, basically, as a dad, he could make some memories with his daughters, because uh, those kind of places just didn't exist um, in the 30s and 40s. Uh, coming out of the Great Depression. And basically, he found out uh, one Friday afternoon that his brother, his big brother, who always watched out for him, always figured out how to fund whatever dreams he had, uh, had set up a meeting on Monday for uh, some New York uh, financial partners, uh, including ABC, actually, that, that uh, basically uh, guys that might be able to write the check to, to fund this, this vision, this dream that Walt Disney had. The problem was all of his big ideas were in his head. And he really uh, needed uh, someone to uh, kind of basically uh, get that out of his head and onto a piece of paper. And so he basically hijacked uh, an artist that didn't even work for him anymore, worked over at 20th Century Fox. He basically bribed him uh, and then hijacked him and locked him in a soundstage for uh, what we call the Lost Weekend. Uh, and the two of those guys basically just sat down and puked this out. Uh, and this, this, um, this beautiful aerial uh, rendering uh, was basically a pencil sketch. Uh, but then it was covered, colored over later, but it basically laid the foundation of this, this city scaled uh, storytelling tool that again, we call the theme park, but basically organizing these districts around the, the narrative genres of the day that really has proved uh, quite powerful and really has many lessons that we've uh, been able to apply uh, at many of the ministry environments that we've, we've done. Similarly, when we started uh, trying to figure out how to redeem uh, this two square miles of uh, area around Disneyland that was kind of, uh, again, going to hell in a handbasket. We had uh, real challenges. We had a big 100 acre parking lot uh, that wasn't very attractive and a lot of perimeter development. And again, we ended up figuring out that story of the, the unique spirit and sense of place that is that golden state of mind with with california venture i would say that when we started we had no budget we joked that our budget was the level of a six flags over disneyland budget we had to we had to uh we had about one fifth the budget that a, a park that was being designed for tokyo uh was uh you know had the luxury of operating within so we literally uh had uh the budget of ordering rides out of a catalog and dressing up metal buildings with billboards and environmental artwork and uh, we environmental graphics. In fact, the, the former entry sign, uh, some of you in the Sacramento area may recognize it because it, it's back where it belongs, which is at the, uh, the uh, state fairgrounds. Uh, and so uh, finally, uh, 10 years later, we did have a master plan to develop a, just a bare bones critical mass park, but then over 10 years to flesh that out. Uh, into a full-fledged uh, Disney level uh, theme park. And that's really what prompted that reopening when they were able to rebuild the entry street into a, a, a 1920s version of Walt's new hometown with Buena Vista Street and then uh, add Cars Land. Uh, but again, this was the, the first draft of the master plan that was just a phase one that only developed about uh, two thirds of the former parking lot. And ironically, the remainder of that parking lot is now uh, still filled with cars. It's cars land now. So it's a little bit more immersive than a black asphalt lot. But even in this first iteration, again, you had um, Hollywood land, you had the Golden State uh, area, the Yosemite and the Sierras, and you had the Pacific Ocean uh, area that's now Pixar Pier embedded. And so this notion of very cost effectively uh, telling the unique story of the people and place of California was always there from day one in a flexible framework that could be adapted over time. And again, those, those uh, spillover effects of reaching beyond the property that we particularly controlled and really being able to justify urbanizing uh, the suburban motels into these vertical mixed use projects with hotel rooms above retail, uh, developments like uh, Anaheim Garden Walk, the expansion of the convention center, the renewal of the Disney Hotel. It really does feel like this lush, walkable urban resort district uh, today. Uh, my pride and joy in this whole effort was just letting people spend the night 
in the magic. We actually figured out how to create a national park themed, uh, we call it national park architecture, a national park, Awani, uh, Yellowstone, Old Faithful Inn themed hotel actually in the new park in California Adventure in the area that was themed to Yosemite. So this was no small trick to figure out how to do subterranean valet parking, ground level retail with downtown Disney and hotel rooms on top of it. And instead of making you feel like you're in the middle of a city to make you feel like you're in the middle of Yosemite, uh, looking at whitewater rapids and a mountain shaped like a grizzly bear. But I think we pulled it off. It's a lot of fun uh, to fall asleep, wake up and still be immersed in the magic. And again, when we're working with ministry environments, uh, we have just the daunting challenge of having extremely limited ministry dollars that really are always competing, right? You could be digging a well for uh, uh, kids in Africa that don't have clean water. You could be uh, spending efforts feeding the homeless or uh, rescuing a little girl from trafficking. And there's a healthy tension there, but we've learned that God's will isn't just to put up bomb shelters for Jesus to come back and torch the earth and evac us to heaven out of here. Uh, but in fact, that he does care that we, uh, uh, you know, reflect his image as image bearers uh, and steward things by uh, creating things that have uh, kind of a maximum kingdom return on investment and aren't just measured in how cheap they are. Um, so for the same amount of money in a lot of cases, we figured out how to redeem and renew spaces. A couple of examples here of just taking existing spaces and and freshening those up. Uh, this is an old uh, Methodist church um, in Oklahoma and just using environmental uh, projection, uh, being able to update that. And um, a lot of times we'll start with storyboards and mood boards to kind of introduce kind of a vernacular and a language. Uh, in this case, to share their history uh, and mission strategy um, and flesh out even their parking lot so that instead of just a big asphalt parking lot, they happen to sit in this really dynamic area. And so we actually envision this idea of this Asbury Square, this kind of gathering place that uh, especially kids at the local colleges and high school could gather uh, right at the front door uh, and create a new youth building called The Block and another cafe that really would be kind of this front porch. So we've moved beyond just the idea of these um, suburban campuses surrounded by an ocean of parking and really figure out how to lower the drawbridge and create uh, portals and gateways and bridges for everyone in the community, not just the members of the Christian Country Club or the faith community to gather, but again, everyone uh, in the community to gather. Uh, it's been really a powerful thing to see what's happened out of that from a, what we call architectural evangelism perspective. I'll share more on that in a bit. Lesson five is the, the idea that form should follow fiction. Uh, anyone that's ever worked with an architect has probably heard the term form follows function. And that's that idea, that basic, minimalist, uh, kind of honest architecture. Uh, and that's how we have all the, the tilt-up warehouses and glass boxes that you see throughout the Silicon Valley. Uh, but throughout history, people have used structures to tell stories. And uh, they've understood that spaces, particularly sacred space and ministry spaces, have told stories. That doesn't just have to be done in some opulent way with the cathedral and gargoyles and uh, and stained glass windows, there's other ways for spaces to tell stories. And again, going back to Walt Disney, because of his uh, relative illiteracy, never finishing college, he always leaned into storyboards. He actually invented storyboarding for the entire motion picture industry, rather than relying on film treatments and scripts uh, and the written word. So he really leaned heavily into this visual language of storyboarding. And in the same way, we storyboard the visitor experience uh, through any environment we do, whether it's a retail environment, whether it's a ministry environment or an entertainment environment. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize that, again, some of these top human magnets on the planet are basically just a bunch of Hollywood sound stages. The vast majority of the indoor air conditioned space in uh, these theme parks are basically pre injured metal or uh, concrete sound stages that are absolutely flexible. When you're walking down Main Street USA, you see a bunch of gingerbread false facades on the front, but behind them are all these really large um, flexible structures that allow you to create walls, to tear down walls, to have the spaces flow into each other uh, over the years. And that's really the case of all the major uh, square footage of any of these parks. Similarly, in our ministry environments, uh, this, this happens to be one of the first children's ministry environments we did almost 20 years ago uh, in Beloit, Wisconsin. Uh, you know, we call it the Rust Belt the armpit of the Rust Belt, because uh, this place uh, is out in the middle of nowhere. The factories have shut down. They use the, the lobby as the community food bank, uh, but we've got this amazing KidWorks uh, children's ministry 
building with just open ceiling, raw concrete, caution tape, uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, basically wallpaper for uh, wraps around the doors. But it's this fun theme where um, basically the kids are being shipped off as, as sources of power and light, uh, batteries and lights uh, sent throughout the world. Um, and really just cost effective, even their, their cafe. This is again, 20 years ago, but just by using the raw concrete and corrugated metal uh, expresses kind of this uh, rust belt uh, redemption of kind of this factory town where uh, men had built a power and light factory and now have uh, abandoned it uh, for God to be the source of power and light uh, to the community. A couple of just quick and dirty, uh, again, before afters, this is a little church in, uh, in the middle of Washington state in a agrarian area called Wenatchee. Uh, and uh, again, just uh, this was where they expected families to be able to somehow figure out that they wanted you to, to take your kids down these stairs into the basement um, to drop off their kids. And so just while we were there with them, we were able to quickly sketch something out that didn't involve any architecture, didn't involve any city permits or plans, uh, but created a, a, a kids ministry environment and a brand. And just by using uh, this this idea of forging a path and, and helping kids find that that narrow path that represents that discipleship journey figure out where uh, parents and kids want to start their journey uh, same thing when you finally get down into the basement rather than that traditional institutional daycare looking facility um, being able to introduce kids to that idea of uh, checking in for this uh, amazing lifelong journey adventure uh, of this base camp of life before they they climb that everest of life um, give us a chance to prepare and equip you for the journey in the road ahead. Um, okay, round in the corner here. Lesson six, we are wired for community. I firmly believe that God, our creator, created us as a, a herd species. Some of us have gone astray, wandered off from the herd, and thought that really what we would do if we won the lottery is buy as much land to separate us and the next family or the next humans as we can afford. And that's basically the American suburban dream is to drive until you qualify uh, for the fattest mortgage and the fattest uh, house and uh, the most space separating us. And what we found, especially in this COVID area, that is that people are wired and hungry for physical connection, not just virtual, digital, fake uh, placebo connection through Facebook and social media, but pe people are actually really wired and hungry for that. And in fact, when Walt Disney died, his dying dream was not to be an entertainer, not to build a bigger Disneyland or Disney World, but actually he felt like in the mid 60s with all the race riots going on uh, and um, the Vietnam War and all the cultural wars, he felt like there was a, that he had learned some things about community and story that he, he what he wanted to offer the world in his legacy was this idea of a new way of doing life together that uh, it was a city on a hill that uh, he called Epcot, an experimental prototype community of tomorrow. So he was passionate about story and community. Uh, and that's something that uh, we've been passionate about as well. And, and we think that the glue uh, on that, by the way, is, uh, is God's plan A for rescuing and redeeming the world, which is the church, the ecclesia. We think Christ-centered community is uh, the convenient solution to so many things from how do we uh, help uh, young men uh, young boys turn into men, uh, just formation, right? Not just spiritual, but social uh, formation. And again, this is what that uh, main entrance road to Disneyland Harbor Boulevard looked like before. Uh, and this is the idea of uh, kind of redeeming that and turning it into a, a taste of heaven with this garden district. And, and again, this was the vision for those of you that have been there. I uh, know that uh, we, we use that many palm trees and more. Uh, with some of the ministry environments, this was the master plan that we're currently working on for Saddleback Church. Uh, 100 acres, mostly a bunch of asphalt and parking, but the vision is that someday it'll have uh, this Main Street, which is downtown Lake Forest. Their suburban community is just a bunch of residential real estate, uh, and there's no actual there, there, there's no downtown. So this would become the downtown with the church at the end of Main Street. Uh, and finally, the, the power of story is the last lesson I want to leave you with. Uh, and that's just the recognition that, again, story has the power to form who we are, transform who we can become. Uh, a, a, another imaginary buddy of mine, he actually uh, was going to be a priest, uh, but he found his calling instead to be an imagineer. Um, he, he was actually in charge of this little Cars Land project. 
Uh, and one of my favorite moments is every night at sunset, um, when the park's open, they recreate that moment of redemption in the film where the, the key character had just finished paving the main road. Uh, and then every uh, citizen of uh, Radiator Springs relit their neon signs one by one. And it gives you the goosebumps because they recreate that moment. Because for my friend, what that represented was that, that moment where Christ comes and redeems and make th makes all things new and reintroduce that renewed heaven and renewed earth. What a beautiful metaphor uh, for kingdom come. And that's really what, what uh, placemaking and design for me is giving a people a taste of the world as it could and should be. And also uh, restoring that broken connection vertically with the creator and horizontally with creation. And this parable of the bean is a great metaphor for how we see uh, culture evolving uh, away from just raw, good and quick, dirty, cheap, commodities uh, to moving beyond just even multi-sensory experiences and a lot of what we focus on these days is this idea of transformational purpose-driven design. Uh, we, For example, we just rolled out yesterday the world's first slave-free chocolate factory. We're, we've created this uh, this Tony's Chocolate Only factory experience in Amsterdam that's very much like a Willy Wonka factory complete with the glass elevator and the roller coaster shooting out of the smokestack but it's all for the purpose of getting rid of child slavery and labor, forced labor uh, in the Ivory Coast of, of Africa. Uh, and again, it can be a church ministry environment. It can be a village that we've developed for uh, survivors of sex trafficking. Um, there's some powerful opportunities there uh, in terms of applying design technologies and tools and paradigms. Um, and so in the ministry space, that means we're creating not passive environments where you can sit in the dark and just get talked at for an hour and check it off your box because you did church once a week, but really moving uh, into environments where people are invited to step into epic stories, experiential, participatory, immersive, connected uh, environments. And, and other architects are called to do these kind of cathedrals. Uh, this is actually the new Oakland Cathedral, which I would have loved to have had this kind of budget to play with. We feel like instead of God calling us to design the tabernacles or the temples of today, that God basically handed us shovels and said, dig boy, uh, and dig these postmodern versions of Jacob's well. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, when I think of Jacob's well, it's a place that not only uh, did that Samaritan woman uh, was able to just get a drink. Uh, she was getting up, she wasn't up searching websites looking for seeker sensitive, purpose driven, uh, growth oriented churches on Sunday morning. Uh, and she wasn't planning on making her way to to Jerusalem, uh, there was just way too many cultural, social, geographic, moral barriers for her to cross. But the God of the universe didn't let any of that stop him. He busted through time and space to connect with her where she was at, uh, at Jacob's well, just trying to get a drink. And that's really what we try to do with a lot of the physical gathering places, whether they're secular gathering places. This happens to be San Gimignano, which inspired uh, the, the central piazza downtown Disney that I worked on. Um, and just a wonderful gathering place, upper level dining terraces, uh, 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 surrounding kind of a postmodern well, not necessarily the most redemptive uh, postmodern well. This is an outdoor bar, which we tried to make, you know, we didn't want it to look like Bourbon Street. So we, we kind of classed it up a little bit with these uh, Art Nouveau wine goblets and um, Art Nouveau Paris Metro inspired stations. But again, in a ministry environment, uh, this is what it looks like. This is Restoration Roasters. It's my favorite coffee house. It was actually started by my partner um, and it's staffed by uh, uh, homeless uh, residents of uh, the Orange County uh, Rescue Mission that are doing jobs training uh, or volunteers. So it's like every cup is a cup of compassion, taste of transformation. Um, this is a, a church, uh, old A-frame church uh, that's been restored and renewed uh, in Surf City, USA, Huntington Beach. Um, actually drawing inspiration from its original founding chapel uh, downtown in Huntington Beach. And, um, and this is a project we're working on up north with Bayside and, and creating downtown Bayside. And, um, you know, the, the former architect, no offense, was uh, in what we, most church work is, is called institutional architecture. Uh, and when I think of that, I think of places that you want to get in, get out of as soon as possible. You want to spend as little time in as possible. So whether it's a prison, an insane asylum, uh, a hospital, a, a high school, that's the category that institutional architects uh, do. And that's the reason that a lot of the buildings uh, at this campus were built with concrete masonry units uh, at CMU block. Uh, they're bulletproof and you can sandblast them when kids graffiti on them, 
but it's not exactly the kind of place that most people want to gather. And so what we've tried to do is fill the spaces between the buildings with this uh, vibrant downtown Bayside indoor outdoor uh, space that could really be a, a great gathering place and uh, some fun befores and after. This is the Midtown campus, former fish market, um, you know, redeeming the uh, parking lot there, and the, the uh, uh, Blue Oaks uh, warehouse that's leased, uh, creating an indoor park um, for uh, moms to gather around some great coffee. I, know, I remember uh, Lincoln Brewster personally picked out that espresso machine. He became quite a coffee snob in the course of uh, collaborating on <laughs> our little design. And, and uh, you know, with Blue Oaks, we were able to design a, that top golf master plan across the way. Um, and so, you know, again, I'm going long. Uh, I wanted to make sure we had time for a few questions. So Mackenzie, you want to um, facilitate that? And I'll just keep scrolling through a couple more of these pictures, but hopefully there's some. Yes, thoughts. absolutely. Can you guys hear me? Just want to make sure. Perfect. Uh, Mel, first and foremost, I want to say thank you so much. Your heart and is so inspiring of the way that you uh, have viewed all this and how it mixes with ministry. And second, I'm just so happy to see pictures of Disneyland. <laughs> that is just the best. It makes me so excited to be able to go back uh, as well as to see Bayside. That's just so great. Um, so a couple questions we have here. So first question, let me scroll up a little bit, is, all right, they said, what are some tips that you have for storytelling when we're seeking to create a great story? So say we're starting from point A, how do you get all the way to point Z? Well, again, um, it really depends on um, which discipline of storytelling, right? Um, and because obviously crafting a Sunday sermon, which is a lot of the ways, you know, a lot of times guys in ministry or gals in ministry, that's the way their focus is, whether it's just a Sunday sermon or creating a sermon series or branding something that's relatively short term. Obviously, that's a different format than a feature length film, which is a different format than a, a theme park. Um, and so it kind of really does depend on... Um, what you're doing again with with our practice we have an entirely different teams that focus on digital storytelling whether it's websites augmented reality virtual reality we have entirely separate teams that are focused on spatial storytelling we're nationally licensed architects i'm a nationally licensed urban planner uh, we've got set designers and uh you know guys that create we we, we created the hogwarts express for universal um studios we, we'll we'll do all this storytelling at different scales but no matter what discipline that we're involved with, we always start with that same fundamental process of asking the who, the where, the why question of character setting and plot. So I, I, that's my quick answer is make sure you've got that down straight because too often people just haven't taken the time out. They might have an interesting theme or a unique take or a unique angle or a unique message, but in and of itself, that's not a story. You need all three of those components to really have a fleshed out story. Awesome. Um, a, another question is, so we have, there's a lot of people who consider themselves either a creative or not a creative. Uh, so if you're more of the type A and you've categorized yourself as not a creative person, how do you lean into the storytelling side of things? Well, I, I would start by saying, don't believe the lies of the devil in terms of <laughs> telling you that you're not creative. Cause, uh, uh, I think, uh, good theology would dictate that you are in fact an image bearer. And I would argue that the image that you're bearing is that of the creator who introduced himself as an Come artist on. and an architect when he, he, his opening lines is in the beginning, he created. Uh, and so guess what? You're creative, you're, you're made in the image of the creator. And the, the reality, unfortunately, is I actually do believe firmly that our education system and our Western paradigms do a lot to, to you know, kind of squeeze that creativity out of us. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of our work is actually trying to just help people re recover and restore uh, that childlike uh, creativity that every kid, frankly, has. But with that said, I think a, a lot of the problem is people just define cre cre creativity uh, in, in too small of terms. There's, there's actually several uh, great books out there um, on uh, everything from brainstorming and lessons learned from, you know, the Imagineering Workout, the Imagineering Way. Uh, that are great lessons for anyone that particularly uh, as applied uh, to business, for example, um, or leading teams or trying to deliver uh, processes that yield uh, some kind of out of the box uh, processes. So again, whether it's ministry planning, business planning, uh, truly just generating works of art, a lot, of, a lot of disciplines that don't necessarily consider themselves, quote, creative, still can take lessons learned 
uh, from the, the, the nonlinear process that, uh, that we have uh, developed uh, kind of over the, the decades of Disney. I love that, absolutely. Uh, next question is, have you run into people who don't catch onto the value of story and what you're doing? And if yes, how have you convinced those with value for function that beauty and design are important in a ministry setting rather than a waste of funds? Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I go back to, you know, we were designing, I don't know, like a, a fellowship lobby space and, and someone's like, we just need functional space. And for their, them, function was a parking lot for their car, a butt for their seat get in, get out. Everything else was fat that they, they wanted to, you know, cut out of. And, um, you know, there's lots of different ways of answering that. You know, one is just literally thinking through when even using their language on them, the idea of function and purpose and really thinking through, okay, what is the function and the purpose of this, this facility, this environment? Uh, again, if you think of it as just how many cars can we park, how many butts and seats, that's pretty thin, but we actually do ask the question of what would be the, the output of, uh, of you know, if, if Jesus was come back and say, you stewarded that, that piece of promised land I gave you really well, you, you stewarded the heaven out of it, what would, that, what would be coming out of that? And, and quite often the answer is something like uh, disciples, you know, uh, fruits of the spirit, relationships, conversations. It's not just hey, we got, you know, however many people on and off the campus and we, we, you know, embedded a couple of points of theological truth once a week. And I mean, usually they are kind of broader things that involve things like community, that involve things like outreach and re relationship. And, and if you think about the majority of institutional facilities, uh, they're not exactly designed to foster relationships and conversations. They're, in fact, they're the opposite. They're, they're really kind of machines to get people in and out. Uh, and again, that, that's kind of one way to approach it is just get, you know, expand the question of really what, what are we trying to do here uh, and think a little deeper than just kind of a, a straightforward approach. I think the other uh, approach, though, is this idea of, of story. We, we've actually found in our practice, it, it's a language that people do resonate with in today's day and age, this, this idea of taking the time to distill our shared story and figuring out, hey, do we have a disconnect between uh, that the person that's driving by that would never even think about pulling onto our property or our building, is there, is there a story that they're getting that we don't want, you know, that's a disconnect from the story that someone that's been maybe raised up in the church or that is plugged in and in relationships, how do we, how do we just kind of fix that, that kind of discordant disconnect between uh, the story of a, a bad facility design or a bad website design? versus uh, the story that we want to be telling. And so just that idea of getting back into alignment of, you know, what's the story that we really uh, feel God's given us to, to steward and to tell, and how do we bring everything into alignment with that in terms of, uh, you know, our, our front porch, our website, our, uh, our street appearance, our curb appeal, uh, the, the physical uh, sense of arrival that the sequence of events someone goes through before they ever get to that point where they can actually be seated uh, and hear some words of eternal life, maybe for the first time in their life. So uh, just that idea of getting obstacles out of the way that would stop someone from hearing, uh, you know, uh, living water or tasting living water and hearing words of eternal life for the first time in, in their life. Yes. Oh, so good. I'm getting, I'm getting pumped up over here. <laughs> it's just so awesome. And the concept of understanding stewardship in your audience, I think is a complete perspective shift on how we look at some of those things. Well, just to honor your time, I have one last question. Uh, and I love this question. Uh, you know, just get, get back. You just said a magic word there, stewardship. It really is yeah. all on how you define stewardship. And if, if frankly, you just, just define stewardship as being as cheap as humanly possible and bearing the talents, guess what? That's not how Jesus describes stewardship. Mm -hmm. If you could spend the same dollar, but get a higher return on investment and get people beaten down your door, <laughs> that's, that's better stewardship. So. Absolutely. It's just like the parable of the 10 talents. It's 100%. Yeah. That's so, so good. Uh, the last question uh, is, is <laughs> so fun. Is just, what does it take to be Imagineer? What does it take to do what you do? <laughs> you know, I get asked that question a lot. I, I teach and back uh, when I was a kid writing my first letter to Disney Imagineering at the ripe old age of 12, giving them pages and pages of advice on all the things that they did wrong and that they needed to fix. Um, before I got the legal nasty gram of cease and desist uh, from them, uh, they, I, I did kind of glean some sound advice. Uh, today, by the way, they do have, uh, and we do partnerships. There's lots of great design schools. We actually started one, the first Christian 
design school in Southern California with uh, Cal Baptist University. We've got a College of Architecture, Visual Arts and Design, but from Savannah College of Art and Design, uh, the, the, the school that Walt Disney started, Cal Arts. There's a number of these great imaginary kind of oriented curriculum now and themed entertainment, themed attractions. Uh, but with all that said, the general advice is find your passion, get really great and amazing at it. Because uh, again, Imagineering needs accountants. They need, <laughs> they need rocket science, they need engineers, they need people that can draw well, that can write well, that can speak well. It really almost, it's not that it doesn't matter, but there is a broad array of, of disciplines that you can find about. I mean, really, if you watch the Imagineering story, that gives you a great scratch at the surface. It's a new uh, documentary series that they released with Disney Plus that really gives you a great look uh, under the hood of, of what we do uh, at Storyland Studios, as well as what Disney Magic, and really that's just so different from what most people think of in terms of uh, what an architect, uh, how they're wired and trained. We, we have nationally licensed uh, teams of architects uh, on our team, but again, that's just one of uh, the dozens of disciplines that it takes to pull off uh, what Disney does and what we do, and so uh, definitely find out about those options, but once you find that out, you'll I'm pretty sure you'll find out that whatever your wiring and passion is, there's a, there's space for you in that, in that industry. Yes. So well said the body of Christ working together. And that's one of my favorite things about this conference in general is we have people on here who are maybe business leaders or ministry leaders, or they're a leader in their home. They're a mom. It's whatever it might be and everyone working together. So that's incredible. Mel, I just want to say thank you so much besides uh, I don't know what could have made this better, except for maybe you sending us all to Disneyland for free. Uh, <laughs> well, but yeah, that, we'll, we'll see you there one of these days. So yeah. let me know when you're in town. <laughs> yes, exactly. But we just want to say thank you so much. If you have your video on, can you just give them some applause so you can see some uh, interaction? We are so thankful for you <laughs> jumping on. And for all of you who have joined us, we just want to say thank you so much. There's a lot of thank yous coming into the chat as well. And just for you to know, all these breakouts have been recorded and they will be able to be accessed as well on the Thrive Conference website. Um, and that will be taking place in the next couple of days. Otherwise, I don't know where you are in the world, what time it is, um, but we will see you tomorrow as we have our day two of our Thrive Summit. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Mel. Thanks, guys.